So yeah, I only intend to be before you for a brief few minutes. Uh, I don't even know if I can call this a sermon as much as just a, a quick devotion from God's word. Um, and it's also different in that I'm, though I'm unpacking a single passage like I typically try to do, there are a couple other passages that I do want us to look at uh, to kind of set background and give context for the passage that I'll eventually um, make my way to to unpack. And so if you've got your Bibles, if you open to John chapter 21 and then put your finger there, we're going to flip back a couple of chapters to John 13 and John 18, just for the sake of context. So John 21, uh, if you didn't bring a Bible, we invite you to use those in the pew pockets in front of you. Uh, you can find this passage on page 617 if the pew Bible is uh, leather, and you can find it on page 964 if it's a hardback pew Bible. But if you find a Bible and turn to John chapter 21, that'd be great. Once you've got John 21, just say, I got it. All right. Now that you got that, if you would flip back a few chapters to John chapter 13. So flip back eight chapters while holding John 21. I want to read to us John 13, 36 through 38. So God's word in John 13, starting at verse 36, reads in this way. Uh, Lord, it's a conversation between Simon Peter and Jesus. Jesus, or Peter says to Jesus, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answers Peter, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. The Lord, Peter asked, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. That's Peter saying he'll give everything for the Lord Jesus. And then Jesus replies to Peter and he says, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, I tell you, a rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. So in this passage, Peter and Jesus are in the midst of a conversation. Peter makes a promise of loyalty to Jesus. And then Jesus, knowing that Peter would fall short on this promise, he prophesies that Peter is actually going to deny him three times and then a rooster's going to crow. It's going to happen at the time of his crucifixion. And Jesus prophesies this and then does it happen? It does. And if you turn with me a few chapters over to John 18, verses 15 through 18, we'll see where it does. So now looking at John 18, 15 through 18. God's word says, Simon Peter was following Jesus, as was another disciple. Uh, that disciple was an acquaintance of the high priest. So he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter remained standing outside by the door. Uh, so the other disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the girl who was the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who was, at, who was the doorkeeper said to Peter, you aren't the one of this man's disciples too, are you? Is the first denial. I am not, Peter said. Now the servants and the officials made a charcoal fire. They made a charcoal fire. They made a charcoal fire. I'm doing that on purpose. Log in your minds that the servants and the officials had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. Uh, they were standing there warming themselves, and Peter was standing with them warming himself. And so we see the first denial happen there. The not denials go on if you skip down to verses 25 to 27 in this same chapter. We see again, it says, now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself by that charcoal fire we just read about. And it says, they said to him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? The second time, Peter denied it and said, I am not. It says, one of the high priest servants, a relative of the man whose, whose ear Peter had cut off said, didn't I see you with him in the garden? So he's asked a third time and Peter says, he denies it again. He says, or yeah, Peter just denies it again. And the text says to us that immediately after this, a rooster crow. And so Jesus told Peter that he was going to deny him three times, that a rooster was going to crow. We see the denials happen there. And just like Jesus said, the prophecy plays out. And as we go to our main passage, we'll see how things play out for Peter after Jesus was crucified and resurrected. This is leading up to his crucifixion. He denies him when he should have been professing loyalty to him like he said he would do. And then in our passage for today from John 21, We'll see how things go for Peter after uh, Jesus is crucified and resurrected. So if y'all would join me now in standing to read the passage that we're actually going to unpack this morning from John 21. God's word in John 21, starting at the first verse. It says, after this, Jesus re revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, 
Thomas called twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons and two others of his disciples were together. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them. We're coming with you, they told him. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. When daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them. You don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Cast a net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. The disciple, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, I'm guessing as he recognizes who Jesus is, he says to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him, for he had taken it off, and he plunged into the sea. Since they were not far from land, about 100 yards away, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire. It had fish lying on it and bread. And then Jesus says to him, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask, who are you? Because they knew now that it was the Lord. And so Jesus came, he took the bread and he gave it to them. And he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, Jesus told him. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. I'm going to stop right there. You can take your seats. With this passage in mind, friends, I want to preach from this thought. Failing forward. Failing forward is a thought. Join me for a brief moment of prayer, if you would. Uh, Father, we give you thanks again for this day. Uh, for all that you've already done in it and for the ways that we trust you will continue to work as we now take, uh, briefly take heed to your word. Give us the grace of understanding. Uh, give us the grace of conviction where needed. Uh, give us the grace of encouragement where needed. And make us all the more faithful to live for your glory in all that we do. Lord, help us to see through this passage uh, that we are never too far gone to be restored and redeemed by Christ. God, help us to see that the redemption and restoration we have in Christ can never be taken away from us. Uh, but he offers it. And even when we forget uh, the position of restoration we have, we've got a Savior who so graciously reminds us, us of it. So we thank you for him. God, I pray and I attempt to preach for his glory and to herald his name that you would give me grace. Uh, God, would you help me to um, maintain a, a, a quality level of focus in light of all the distractions that we have this morning? Uh, give your people focus so that they could take heed to your word. And bless us, Father, to, uh, to again, comprehend and to act according to what you call us to in this passage. We love you. We thank you. It's for your glory. We depend upon your spirit. And in the name of your son that I both pray and preach. Amen. Hakuna Matata. It means, y'all finish it. No worries. Y'all got it. Y'all got it. Y'all must have seen the movie Lion King. Uh, Lion King is probably my favorite movie of all time. And if you know Lion King well, then you know that we've learned that phrase, Hakuna Matata, from Simba, who, in the Lion King movie, at a point was a bit of an estranged son. Uh, the storyline of the movie actually starts to rise in action as Simba takes a fall from grace. Uh, he was an estranged, disgraced son, confronted with a great mistake of his, needing to be confronted with grace and restoration after this great mistake. Uh, Y'all know the story. Uh, Simba was this... Uh, curious and overly courageous lion cub. Uh, he'd been told by his majestic kingly lion of a father that he was not to roam into certain parts of their land. Uh, well, Simba's evil, jealous uncle, Muf Mufasa, uh, tricked Simba into roaming away from home. I'm sorry, Scar. He tricks him into roaming away from home. And then he starts a, a stampede of wildebeest that makes, that he, that makes appear as if it was Simba's fault. Uh, Simba gets trapped in the stampede, 
Then as a part of his manipulative plan, Scar tells Simba's father that he, that he was trapped. Uh, Simba's father shows up to rescue Simba, but he dies in the process. And because the whole thing had been manipulated by Scar, it all appears as if it was Simba's fault. So Simba is overcome by guilt and he runs away from home. He runs away becoming an estranged, disgraced son who was confronted with a great mistake, but needing to be confronted with great grace and restoration after his great mistake. I just wonder if you've ever been there before church. Confronted with a great mistake. Faced with the reality of your own slip up. So much so that you feel the need to abandon all you know, to flee from what is familiar, to run away from the company that makes you comfortable in order to run toward the misery of musing over your own mistake. Have you ever been there before? That's essentially what we find Peter in this morning's passage. Uh, we've seen in the passage that we read a minute ago where Peter made a profession of, of uh, this kind of immovable loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've seen in passages that we read after that where Peter was presented the chance to act in his loyalty, but instead acted in disloyalty. And those passages in John chapter 18 are the last extensive details we see about Peter before we get here to John chapter 21. Like if there is no John chapter 21, then the flavor that's left on the palate of our minds about Peter, as we read through this narrative, it's the flavor of Peter denying the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's almost as if John wants to give us a palate cleanser and redeem our perception of Peter by what he records here in John chapter 21. Uh, this part of the narrative takes place uh, after Jesus has died and after he's risen from the dead and he's now spending time on earth in his resurrected body. I told y'all last week, this is why I wanted to preach uh, this kind of tail end of John's gospel during the weeks that have followed Easter. We just celebrated the Lord's resurrection, and so it's been cool to kind of look at how the Lord dealt with his followers and what he spent his time doing in those days that actually did immediately follow his resurrection before he ascended into heaven. And in this passage, we find the Lord giving restoration to a disgraced, downcast Peter. I'm going fishing, Peter says in verse 3. And now at first, it may sound like Peter's just kind of going to engage in a hobby of his, like fishing is a fun thing. Uh, Peter had a history of fishing, so it may sound like he just wants to go and, and have some fun doing something he loves. But if you know Pete, and if you know the flow of John's gospel, then you know that this statement from Peter is actually pregnant with all kinds of implicit statements. Remember, the world has been turned upside down by Jesus' uh, death and resurrection. Uh, Jesus' followers are somewhat confused about how they're to live now. Uh, everybody's thinking about the time they spent with Jesus before he was killed. Uh, they're still coming to understand the resurrection, and some are confused about how they're still spending time with him after they saw him be killed. All these things are on everybody's minds, and in the midst of it, what's likely on Peter's mind was that last encounter we read in John chapter 18. Remember, we, we've not seen any other words from Peter since he denied Jesus in John chapter 18. He made a statement of denial in those verses, and then we come here to these verses, and the very next thing out of his mouth is, I'm going fishing. Which, by the way, again, more background on Pete. Uh, fishing is what he did. It's what he had a history of before he met Jesus. Y'all see where this is going? Peter was a fisherman before he met Jesus. Jesus showed up and changed his life. But now that he's made this mistake of denying Jesus, he feels the need out of his own sense of guilt and disgrace to run back to what he used to know. And isn't that the way sin tempts us, church? To run back to what we used to know? Uh, doesn't failure tempt us to flee? Doesn't relapse tempt us to retreat? And so I gotta ask you this morning, what is it when you fail, when you relapse, that tempts you to flee and retreat away from Christ? Uh, what is it, church, that beckons for your return when you're confronted with your failures? What is it that whispers in your ear that you're the same you who you used to be and that what used to have you still has you? What is it that tugs at your heart and wants to pull you back into the old patterns of the old self? I don't know, maybe what, I don't know what it may be for you, but I come to tell you this morning, church, that whatever it be that tugs, whatever it be that whispers, whatever it be that beckons, it beckons, whispers, and tugs in vain. Because what Christ has, he would never lose. And if Christ has you, then there ain't no losing you to the old you, church. And so even in these moments when you're confronted with your feelings and a glimpse of what you used to be tries to overshadow what you've been made, remember that God tells you, friends, that you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Remember that God tells you that God knows those who are his. Remember that he tells you that you've been given to Christ by the Father and none who are given to Christ by the Father will he turn away or cast out. Remember that God's word tells you, friends, that Christ won't lose any who are his, but will raise them up on the final day. 
Remember that God's word tells you that you've been given eternal life, that you'll never perish, that you can never be snatched out of the hand of God. Remember that God's word tells you, friends, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Remember, church, that you don't have to go back to what Jesus has rescued you from. How do we know? Well, because in this passage, when Peter tries to go back, Jesus shows up and he points Peter forward. Uh, Pete says he's going fishing. Uh, The rest of the crew says they're going with him. And so there they are fishing on the Sea of Tiberias, verse one says, which, by the way, the Sea of Tiberias is just another name for the Sea of Galilee. It's the exact same place where Jesus initially met these men. They were fishermen who had grown up in Galilee and had fished these waters all of their lives. This is literally a picture of them reverting back to their old selves. But in spite of being professional fishermen who had fished these waters their entire lives, the text tells us that they fished all night long, yet caught nothing. Well, Jesus shows up on the shore. They don't realize who he is at first, but he calls out from the shore and tells them to throw the net on the specific side of a boat on a specific side of the boat, and end up catching more than they could handle. The interesting interesting thing about this is that it isn't the first time this has happened. Uh, Luke tells us in his gospel that when Jesus first met these men, they were on the Sea of Galilee. They had fished all night long. They had caught nothing. Jesus showed up. He told them where to put the net. They caught more than they could handle, and it was that interaction which made them follow Jesus in the first place. So here they are, church being led by old Pete, trying to flee in light of failure, reverting back to old ways. They're in the exact same place, facing the exact same circumstance from right before they met Jesus. And now Jesus shows up and he does the exact same thing he did to initially call them into a life of following him. And so I told you a minute ago that when you feel tempted to revert back to old ways, that you should remember who you are in Christ and that you should remember that Christ will never lose you. Maybe I can say it better for us. Instead of trying to remember it yourself, Maybe it's better to say, just look for Christ to remind you of who you are and to remind you that he'll never lose you. Because while we may forget, church, Christ will never forget. And he won't ever let you forget. While relapse may come in the face of failure, when you're in Jesus, friends, Jesus comes in the face of relapse. And that's exactly what he does here for Peter. After Jesus supernaturally helps them to fill their nets with the fish, uh, John remembers that first encounter with Jesus. So he says to Peter, this is the Lord. Well, Pete gets so excited that he jumps out of the boat and swims to the shore. And now notice what awaits them on the shore as they arrive in verse 9. Jesus is there, and he's cooking breakfast. He's got bread, he's got fish, and he's cooking it on a charcoal fire. Y'all catch that? He's got bread, he's got fish, and he's cooking on a charcoal fire. He's cooking it not just on a fire, but on a charcoal fire. Uh, This word for charcoal fire, it appears only twice in the New Testament. Here, and back in John chapter 18, when Peter denied Jesus while standing next to a charcoal fire. You know, the old factory nerve, it's it's something serious, man. Like this, it's this nerve in the brain that allows us to smell a thing and then think about another thing. The olfactory nerve is what makes you think of the beach when you smell sunscreen or or camping when you smell bug spray or Christmas when you smell gingerbread or your significant other when you smell their perfume or cologne. It's what makes me think of strapping up to go play football when I walk into a locker room. And I imagine, friends, that it would have made Pete think of that last charcoal fire as he swam onto this shore and smelled this new charcoal fire. I think that's actually John's purpose in including this detail. He wants us to be taken back to what Pete was taken back to, that moment of denial after he made a promise of immovable loyalty. And just as Pete tries to revert back to old ways, when he tries to flee in light of failure, Jesus shows up with a charcoal fire to point Peter forward and restore him to his God-given purpose. So the disciples make it to shore. Jesus invites them to bring some of their fish to contribute to the breakfast. Uh, They eat good, and then after breakfast, Jesus directs his attention specifically to Peter in verse 15. And in verses 15 through 19, Jesus takes Peter through a three-part series of the same question being asked three different times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Peter says each time, he says yes. He's discouraged by the fact that Jesus actually has to ask him three times. But he doesn't realize that Jesus isn't asking for his own assurance. Jesus, friends, is asking so that Peter would be reassured that he loved Jesus. You see, Peter denied Jesus three times in John 18, 
And so Jesus gives Peter three separate chances to confess his love here in John 21. And as Peter confessed his love for Jesus three times, Jesus commissioned him three times to labor for his kingdom. You love me? Then feed my lambs. You love me? Shepherd my sheep. You love me? Feed my sheep. It was a reminder to Peter, friends, that in spite of his great mistake, he had not been robbed of his God-given purpose to be used in God's kingdom. And now they have you, Christian. The beauty of the gospel is that God found you when you were messed up. And God is willing and able to keep you in spite of your mess ups. He found you when you were messed up and he doesn't throw you away when you mess up in the future. He is willing and able to keep you in spite of your mess ups. Let's pray with joy while we have that in mind. Father, we give you thanks uh, that as your people, mess ups don't result in us being tossed aside. But as your people, mess ups give opportunity for us to be reminded of just how great your grace is. God, we thank you that you were gracious toward Peter. And as we see the model of this in your word, we can pray with joy today because you're also gracious toward us. I pray that we never lose sight of this in the gospel. Might we not just be glad that we're saved, but might we always be glad, Father, that salvation is not something that can be lost. It's ours, and in spite of the sins that we'll be tempted with going forward, it'll always be ours. And so we thank you, Father, for eternal salvation in Christ Jesus, and that it can't be snatched away. We pray this in his holy master's name. Amen.